YouTube and welcome to today's Castro in the Classroom Lunchtime Astronomy Session. My name's Fiona Panther and I'm live here at Mount Stromlo Observatory in Canberra and today we'll be talking about exploding stars. I think it's pretty exciting and hopefully by the end of today you will too. So give me just one second while I get our presentation loaded up and then we can get started. So today, we're going to be talking about the explosive lives and deaths of stars. Specifically, we're going to be talking about what happens when a star comes to the end of its life. This is an event that astronomers call a supernova. Now, I work here at the Australian National University, and this is just one of the many things that I've been working on during my PhD. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself to start with. So who am I? Well, here at AANU, I work as a PhD student. This means that I've finished my undergraduate degree in mathematics and physics, and I've gone on to do research full time. So while I'm still a student, instead of sitting in a classroom all day, instead I'm doing research. What I work on specifically is exploding stars and the production of something called antimatter in our galaxy, the Milky Way. I also work part time as a tutor and lecturer I teach university students about cosmology and general relativity. General relativity is Einstein's theory of how space and time are made up. And I also spend some of my research time developing software. I write computer programs which hopefully make astronomers' lives easier and make it easier for them to do their research. So what is being a scientist like? What do we actually do all day? Well, most of my time as a theorist I spend my time writing computer programs to model how antimatter travels around our galaxy. Occasionally, I also get to use a telescope. And to using telescopes, I observe the galaxies far away in the universe where stars explode. We do this to try and better understand the type of stars which end their lives as supernovae. Most of my time, I am using computers. And I use programming languages like Python to help me build powerful computer programs which can help us uncover the mysteries of our universe. I also spend some of my time planning workshops to teach astronomers more about software engineering, to share our work. And of course, I spend most of my time talking and collaborating with other scientists around the world. There's no such thing as a lone researcher these days. All science is done by large collaborations or even smaller groups of maybe 10 to 20 people. Being able to collaborate and communicate are really important skills in science. It's not all about being good at maths and physics. You can find out a little bit more about what I do on my website. It's down the bottom of the screen there. And you can see it says antimatter.space. And you can find out more about me at forward slash about and more about the work I do at forward slash science. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about exploding stars or supernovae. This image is a very famous one. It shows a supernova, which is called 1994D. When we talk about supernovae, we often name them by the year they were discovered in. The first supernova discovered in any given year is given the name capital A, B, C, and so on. Then once we run out of letters, after we've had 26 supernovae, the 27th is called that year, and then a small letter, and so on. This one here was the fourth discovered in the year 1994. This image has become very famous because the galaxy it occurred in is obviously very beautiful. The supernova you can see in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. It looks like it could just be an ordinary foreground star. What's incredible about supernovae is that for just a few short weeks, they can produce enough light to outshine the billions of stars in the galaxy in which they explode. In the case of 1994d, it stands out very clearly beside the dark dust lanes which are absorbing light from the stars in the host galaxy. But what is a supernova? What we need to, do, what we need to learn about to understand supernovae better are the life cycles of stars. Stars, just like us, are born, live through their lives, and die. And just as humans may experience many different things during their lifetime, 
stars also live very different lives. Generally, we split stars in, in their life cycles into two categories. The life cycles of small stars, like our sun, that they make up most of the stars in the universe, and the life cycles of massive stars. These massive stars are usually more than eight to ten times the mass of our sun. But all stars form in the same way. Large clouds of dust and gas in the universe, called nebulae, begin to be pulled together by the force of gravity. As the cloud condenses under the force of gravity, eventually there is so much pressure pulling together the atoms in the nebula that the atoms begin to press into one another, starting a process called nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is a very important process when we talk about supernovae, and I'll be talking more about it later on. Sometimes astronomers get lazy, and occasionally we refer to the process of nuclear fusion as burning. What it's important to remember is the process of nuclear fusion is the process of taking the inner part of an atom, the nucleus, and pressing them into each other to form a new, larger nucleus. On the other hand, when you burn a substance in chemistry, you expose it to oxygen and you change its ele electron structure. So while we use the term burning to describe nuclear fusion, it's really a very different process. As nuclear fusion begins, what happens is it halts the, the gravitational collapse of the nebula. The nuclear fusion produces light and heat, and what is born is a protostar. Now, a star like our sun, has a mass of around 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, or one solar mass. From forming a protostar, the sun, well, a star like our sun, will eventually leave its star-forming nebula, and over billions and billions of years, it is living through its life, fusing together atoms of hydrogen in its very center. Over billions of years, this star gradually begins to run out of hydrogen. Once this happens, in the core, what remains is helium. So when you take two hydrogen atoms and fuse them together, you get the atom helium. And once the star has run out of hydrogen, it has to start fusing this helium to produce energy. When this happens, the star evolves into what we call a red giant. A red giant star is fusing helium in its core. And it's, as this produces much more energy than fusing together hydrogen, the star expands due to the new increased amount of heat being produced in its core. Once the star finishes fusing helium, it evolves into what we call a planetary nebula. The outer layers of the star are shed and glow in the just residual light and heat which were produced by the star during its lifetime. What remains at the very centre of the planetary nebula is something we call a white dwarf. The white dwarf is composed primarily of atoms of carbon and oxygen, but it is no longer fusing together these atoms to produce light and heat. Just like when you turn off the element on the stove, it glows with residual heat for maybe 10 to 20 minutes. In the case of a star, the white dwarf can continue glowing with this residual heat from the star's main sequence lifetime for billions of years. So this is the fate of a star like our sun. It ends its life as a cooling and fading white dwarf star. On the other hand, the lives of massive stars are much more exciting. Massive stars live fast and die young. So while a star like our sun can live for 10 billion years, a massive star, 10 times the mass of our sun, evolves into a red supergiant in only a few million years. In the core of this red supergiant star, there is a lot more gravity due to there being a lot more mass, and heavier elements form. Eventually, you end up with a core of iron, with outer and progressively lighter elements as you move outwards. Once the core of this star reaches a mass we call the Chandrasekhar limit, 1.4 solar masses in the very centre, the gravitational force pulling inwards is no longer enough to support the star against gravitational collapse. Smaller stars, smaller massive stars, maybe eight times the mass of our sun, will then collapse into something called a neutron star, 
while as more massive stars will blow, will blow off their outer layers and the core gravitationally collapses further into a black hole, all just a few million years after the star has formed. It's like a second in astronomer's time. Let's talk more about this core collapse supernova, the ultimate fate of the massive stars in our galaxy. So as you can see here, I was describing the structure just before of the massive star. In the very center is a core of iron. Outside the iron core is a layer of silicon, then oxygen, then carbon, a large thick layer of helium, and finally an outer layer of hydrogen. So as the star nears its, um, the end of its life, it takes on this onion layer-like structure. So the star at this stage has a radius of a few hundred million kilometers. So here we're only looking at its inner, uh, the, just the innermost layers. Iron is a very special element. Unlike everything lighter than iron, it cannot undergo nuclear fusion. So the core of this star is not actually generating any heat through this process. There is no, therefore no pressure pushing outwards due to the heat. So the gravitational force pushing inwards can overcome this outgoing pressure. This only happens at the point when the core reaches this special mass, the Chandrasekhar limit of 1.4 solar masses. The process of igniting the supernova explosion takes less than a second. And in less than a second, this iron core collapses. The material falls inwards. Eventually, it falls inwards to such a point that it essentially bounces off itself and you form an outgoing pressure wave. Now, something very interesting happens here. This pressure wave according to most of the laws of physics we know, should fail to actually blow the star up into a supernova. So what is driving the pressure wave after it bounces off the core? Now, if you hold up your thumb, and you hold it up, just, just hold it up in the air, every single second passing through your thumb are billions of tiny particles we call neutrinos. Neutrinos are particles which form during nuclear fusion reactions just like those going on in the sun right now that are producing the light and heat that we're experiencing here on Earth. The special thing about neutrinos is that they usually pass straight through things, through our thumb, through our bodies, in fact, all the way through the Earth, without interacting with anything else. However, when you have an incredibly dense environment, such as that inside the shockwave of the supernova, these neutrinos actually produce an outward pressure and this is what scientists believe drives this explosion of the core collapse supernova. So as you can see here, as this shock wave sweeps through the star, it blows apart those outer layers. And all that remains in the center is this incredibly dense core. Now, if the star isn't too massive, maybe eight solar masses, you are left with a star which is entirely composed of neutrons. So a neutron star here, we show it, is about 1.5 times the mass of the sun. And all of that mass is condensed into a radius of only 10 kilometers. Shown in comparison on the left is the same scale for Manhattan, which is in New York. Which is quite incredible when you think about it. A teaspoon of a neutron star, well, that would probably weigh as much as 50 elephants. Now, if you have an even more massive star, what you ultimately end up with is a black hole. A black hole occurs when you squeeze a finite amount of matter into an infinitely small region of space. So here we have our 1.5 uh, solar mass of material, and all of that mass has been squeezed into this infinitely small point in space. And here what we see compared to the radius of the neutron star and this region of Manhattan is something we call the Schwarzschild radius. The Schwarzschild radius represents the point you have to get as close as you can get to a black hole without falling inwards. Once you cross this radius, you effectively have to be moving faster than the speed of light to escape a black hole. And this is how they get their name. From a black hole, 
Not even a photon of light can escape. So earlier I was also talking about stars like our sun. And stars like our sun, well, they end their lives as white dwarf stars. But what happens if you have a white dwarf star which is born in a pair, in a binary? So binary means two, and not all stars are born alone like our sun. Well, it turns out that these binary white dwarf stars may actually form a different type of supernova, which has been used to measure the accelerated expansion of our universe, measuring a quantity called dark energy. So let's talk a little about our universe and how we've come to understand this picture here I'm showing. The universe began around 13.7 billion years ago in an event called the Big Bang. After the Big Bang, there was a period of incredibly rapid inflation, which took place over a few billionth billionths of a second. After inflation, the expansion of the universe begins to slow down. Now, the universe is filled with things which have mass. Ordinary matter, just like us, and also this special thing called dark matter. And dark matter we call dark matter because it only interacts with other things through the force of gravity. So if our universe is filled with things which have a gravitational force of attraction among themselves, shouldn't it, this expansion of the universe be slowing down? And this was exactly what scientists thought was occurring. So, a group of scientists set out to measure this decelerating expansion very accurately. But to do this, they needed some kind of ruler. They needed something we call a standard candle. A standard candle allows you to measure distances in the universe. If you know how bright an object near to you is, then you can tell what distance the same object is away from you by calibrating this, this brightness. And one thing we can use as a standard candle is this event here. So this supernova is a very special type of supernova. It's called a thermonuclear supernova or a type 1a supernova. And it turns out that these events, no matter where they occur in the universe, are always intrinsically the same brightness. So if you got up close to one nearby, it would be so bright. If you went very close to an, the same type of supernova occurring in a distant galaxy, it would be just as bright. So here we can use these as standardizable candles to measure distances in the universe. And that was exactly what scientists did. So let's take a closer look at this image here. When, the, when scientists went out to measure the decelerating expansion of the universe, they found something very, very strange. They found that the universe's expansion was actually accelerating. So what this means is that very distant objects in the universe, very distant galaxies, are moving away from us much faster than galaxies are moving away from us in the local universe. Because we don't fully understand what causes this expansion, we refer to the force which is pushing these galaxies apart as dark energy. This was the discovery which uh, won the, the, the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2011. And if you're here in Australia, one of those Nobel Prize winners' names might be very familiar to you. It's ANU's own Professor Brian Schmidt. So three people were awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery, which was actually made back in 1997. They were Brian Schmidt, Adam Rees, and Saul Perlmutter. Today, scientists are trying to understand dark energy by trying to understand in much more detail these supernovae we term as standard candles, these type 1a supernovae. Now, while we can use them as incredibly accurate rulers to measure distance, we don't fully understand what they actually are. There are two possible scenarios. In one, you have a white dwarf star, which accretes material from its companion star, and it might be a star just like our sun, or a red giant star. As the white dwarf star grows in mass to that special mass limit, the Chandrasekhar limit, 1.4 solar masses, when it approaches that mass, it can actually explode in a thermonuclear explosion. Another possibility is that you in fact have two white dwarf stars orbiting one another. When these two white dwarf stars especially essentially spiral in toward one another, 
they can merge, then total mass is greater than the Chandrasekhar mass or equal to it. And once again, you get this runaway thermonuclear explosion. So while we can observe these supernovae, we don't fully understand what they are or how they explode. So how can we understand this better? Well, in an ideal world, one of these supernovae just like this one would explode in our own galaxy close enough for us to see the stars which ended their lives this way. However, we only see one of these explosions in our galaxy maybe once every 300 years. And we can't wait around all day for that to happen. Instead, what we do is we use computer simulations to try and model the explosions, how their brightness changes with time, and the different colours of light that are emitted by the elements which are formed during the explosion. Here you can see an image from a simulation um, which has been run, and on the left hand side you see the time since the initial explosion, 0.3 seconds. The white colour is showing where there is nuclear thermonuclear fusion occurring in the star. As we move through time, you can see that this fusion spreads outwards. Eventually, it forms into this shockwave explosion. This is the unbinding of this white dwarf star. So here, what we're seeing is that the explosion takes only maybe one and a half seconds. So how do we model this exactly? Well, here's our, here's our image that we get from our simulation. And this is a, represents around one second that, of how the explosion would proceed in nature. However, computing this requires several days of time on what we call a supercomputer. So a supercomputer is kind of like your computer, lots and lots and lots of your computer just stacked one on top of the other. So you have maybe tens to hundreds of thousands of CPUs, central processing units, all running calculations which show how this explosion proceeds. So just this simple model of this explosion, representing only around one second of a process in the natural world, takes scientists several days of computer time to simulate, which is quite incredible. And what we do here is we model the explosion, and we model how the nuclear fusion occurs in the explosion. We model things like how much iron forms. Iron, which is produced in these supernovae, which goes into our blood. So what we're really studying here is we're studying the process of creating the elements which make you and me and everything we know around us. But what's even more incredible is that by modeling and understanding these explosions, we can further understand the things which are currently mysterious to us scientists, things like dark energy. So I leave you with this incredible picture showing this just one star exploding in this very distant galaxy. Travel that light from that explosion has traveled for thousands and thousands of years to reach us here on Earth. So if anyone has any questions in the live stream, I will try and answer those now. It's going to be a little bit of an awkward switch over while I go back to using my camera. And then while I go back, just to viewing the live stream chat, if I can, and I'll see if I can answer any of your questions. So has anybody got any questions? So if not, we'll probably end the live stream here. Thank you very much for tuning in, and I hope you've all learned something about the exciting world of exploding stars. If you have any more questions, you can get in touch with me via Twitter. My handle is at vpanther. And you can also find out more about me on my website, antimatter.space. Thank you very much, guys, and have a great afternoon.